Proto and welcome back to Political Tea for this week. I'm back, feeling fresh, ready to go. Another day, another sleigh. <laughs> right now, the average age of this 52nd Parliament is 49 years old. Okay, Boomer. <laughs> All of this is a real distraction from what we've got, what a government should be focused on. I think there's some 16 and 17 year olds that are smarter than most of us, to be honest. We know Crate Day's a great day, and under Acts it would be a national holiday. We're going to create youth offender military academies. There's no better way to get fitter, faster, stronger, better, more well-connected criminals than uh, by chucking them all together in an army camp. Somehow it will become illegal to call someone a Karen. That is absolutely incorrect and I apologise. That means these laws will not protect that member from such a claim. <laughs> I'm Cameron Charles and we're pouring the political tea. We are, we are, we are indeed pouring the political tea, as we do on political tea. I... <laughs> How do I explain? For once in this entire year, I have not been keeping up with what's going on in Parliament, because I am genuinely scared to look, because everywhere I look, I'm getting told different things. So, we can have a look today. Um, it's... A little bit, a little bit interesting. How do I explain? How do I explain? So, we'll start with a, well, an article from NZ Herald. Oh, if my internet would like to load. <laughs> <laughs> Coalition talks, National Act, NZ First, chase final deal as MPs return to Wellington. MPs from the go... I love ads on this website. MPs from the governing parties are returning to Wellington in their droves, raising expectations the deals will be signed soon. National Deputy Leader Nicola Willis and Hutt South MP Chris Bishop have returned to Wellington as co coalition deal beckons. Willis said she hoped the three parties were able to close a deal, however her more immediate focus was going home to see her four children who she'd seen sparingly in recent weeks. Bishop, arriving in one of Christopher Luxon's shirts, said he had run out of clothes but also was looking forward to seeing his family. Willis said she hadn't been told whether the position of Deputy Prime Minister had been appointed. She, among ACT leader David Seymour and NZ First Leader Winston Peters, was a front-runner for the role. Asked whether she wanted it, Willis said, all I want is a good government for New Zealand. She confirmed there was no caucus meeting planned for National today, but said there would likely be discussions via phone this evening. Bishop, who could take on leader of the House role in the next government, ruled out ha the House returning next week. It's all a bit in flux, but I won't be. F but it won't be for some days. There are a variety of things that have to happen for the House to sit. It won't be next week. He wouldn't answer whether he had been given ministerial portfolios yet, and wouldn't speculate on when a deal might be reached. While National Leader Christopher Luxon and Ag Leader David Seymour are both still in Auckland. NZ First Shane Jones is also expected to arrive in Wellington today, and most other F NZ First MPs are already in Wellington. NZ First Leader Winston Peters is also understood to be planning to travel to Wellington at some point soon. However, there are still some final details of the deal to be resolved around the appointment of ministers, including the Deputy Prime Minister. Luxon and Seymour are expected to talk further after their meeting yesterday, at which Seymour made it clear he expected more ministerial appointments, given ACT had a higher share of the vote than NZ First, and also set that out as a reason for ACT to get the... Ooh, sorry. ACT to get the Deputy Prime Minister's role. While Seymour has completed his consultation with the ACT Party Board, he has yet to call a caucus meeting. That won't happen until the final deal is ready to sign. It is understood all parts of the deals are now complete, other than ongoing wrangling over ministerial portfolios. The final negotiating points are understood to include the number of portfolios the smaller parties are getting and the areas they are in. The Deputy Prime Minister role is among them, and yesterday Seymour made it clear that he thought he had a, the better claim for that job. He also made it clear that he expected ACT to get more ministerial roles than NZ First, given the election result was better. The leaders are in Auckland today, where more talks are expected to be held. They will then travel to Wellington to announce and sign the deal. 
The timing of that could be affected by the weather. Fog in Wellington yesterday has disrupted flights. However, the MPs of all parties are on standby and waiting to be called to meet to agree on the deals. This, that has to happen before they are signed. Last night, Seymour met and... <laughs> <laughs> Last night, Se Seymour met the Act Board, which must be consulted under the party's constitution. Seymour told the Herald late last night that barring any major last-minute changes, he would not need to go back to them. However, Act's caucus meeting will wait until the deal is ready to be signed, and that will require ministerial posts to be agreed on. Seymour's open pitch for the Deputy Prime Minister role appeared to take National and NZ First by surprise. Other options for the role are Luxon's Deputy, Nicola Willis, and NZ First Leader, Winston Peters. It's also understood that other ministerial positions are also proving sticking points. While the parties have agreed on the policy platform, who will lead some of the more contentious areas, such as work around the Treaty of Waitangi, are taking more work. All three parties have issues to address about the way the Treaty of Waitangi is treated in legislation, and debate required over the principles of the Treaty, the direction being taken by public service and related issues such as the naming of government departments. Issues include whether or not to keep the Office for Māori Crime Relations to Arafiti as it stands and who will lead that work. Seymour told the Herald on Wednesday morning that no formal meeting had yet been arranged but the three parties would be in talks today. The final outstanding issues remained the makeup of Cabinet, Seymour said, while adding no one position was more important than the other. It was quite possible ACT would want responsibility in the tr Treaty of Waitangi space. Luxon confirmed yesterday that the only outstanding issues were ministerial responsibilities, which include who gets the role of de Deputy Prime Minister. We've got all three parties agreeing with each other's policy programs as well, and now we have agreed we're going to operate in Cabinet and how we are going to work together. Seymour made a pitch for that job yesterday, saying there was a clear case for ACT to have the role given it was the second largest party in government, and therefore there's a second role in the government it should go to the second party. Peters would not answer the question about the deputy job when he left Cordes Hotel in Auckland yesterday after meeting with Luxon. Previously, Peters and Seymour have stated policy was more important to them than ministerial positions. Act has always said that policy, policies for people are more important than positions for politicians. National having wrapped up policy agreements ahead of discussing those positions could help its case as Seymour and Peters would be going back on their word if they dig their heels in too much. Yesterday, Luxon was clearly unimpressed with Seymour's apparent public pitch for the deputy role, turning Seymour's own earlier reference to wheat bix back on him. Seymour said Luxon had clearly had one too many wheat bix after Luxon stated that the policy talks between National and the two smaller parties were completed. On Seymour's public airing of the deputy prime minister claim, Luxon said he probably got up and ate a whole lot of wheat bix this morning before saying all parties had agreed to keep talks confidential. Luxon appeared to downplay the position, saying it was still up for negotiation and adding he thought it was largely ceremonial. The exact form of the new government also appears to be in the balance, with Luxon yesterday declining to answer questions about if, it's, if a formal three-party coalition was on the cards or another arrangement. It is also unclear if there will be one agreement between the parties or separate agreements. Seymour has previously said he could sit on the crossbenches if ACT didn't get its way. Irrespective of format, what's obvious is that all three parties need to work together, Luxon said. There are pros and cons of lots of different arrangements. Luxon met separately with Seymour at his Auckland home yesterday and Peters in the afternoon at the Quarters. In his meeting with Peters, he was joined by National Party President Sylvia Wood. So clearly there's a little bit of tension there, which, honestly, not surprised. A little bit of tension. We're going to see how this goes. Obviously it's a little bit confusing because no one really knows where we're at right now. Everything's a bit up in the air. But, I mean, it is what it is. It is what it is. Anyway. I'm gonna pop on some tunes and yeah, have a little have a little break. So <laughs> first one is and I'm not a fan, but I'm gonna put on some Taylor Swift because this song's actually a banger. So don't blame me. Don't blame me, love made me crazy. If it doesn't you ain't doing it right. Lord save me, my drug is my baby. I'd be using for the rest of my life. It's a long time and toying with them older guys just to play things for me to use. Something happened for the first time in the darkest little paradise, shaking, blazing. I just need you. This 
type Don't make me love, make me crazy If it doesn't, you ain't doing it right Lord, save me, my drug is my baby I'd be using for the rest of my life Don't make me love, make me crazy If it doesn't, you ain't doing it right Oh, Lord, save me, my drug Whatever you decide and I'm just gonna call you mine I'm insane, but I'm your baby Your baby Echoes, echoes of your name inside my mind Halo, hiding my obsession I once was poison ivy, but now I'm your daisy to stay Don't bring me love Make me crazy If it doesn't you ain't doing it right Lord save me My drug is my baby I'll be using for the rest of my life Don't bring me love Make me crazy If it doesn't you ain't doing it right Oh Lord save me My drug is my baby I'll be using for the rest of my life
so Island in the Sun by Weezer. Honestly, kind of a vibe. Haven't really listened to much of their stuff, but I think it's good. Anyway, tee -hee. So, back to politics is stressful and uh, confusing as it is. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, at the moment, I don't know if it's just me, but looking at um, any articles on politics just gives me, like, 100 anxiety. <laughs> I'm like, this is a bit, this is, this is, this is, this is freaky. This is freaky. Yeah, anyway, sorry, side note, tee -hee. <laughs> um, here we go. So, Te Pāti Māori expects incoming government to take stick to Māori bureaucrats apply a funding handbrake. Te Pāti Māori President John Tamahere expects the new government to take the stick to Māori and for programmes signed off under Labour to be cut by the new Act NZ First and National Coalition. Tamahere said, Time taken on coalition talks is understandable, as National Act and New Zealand First are trying to work out which of their favoured policies will get some of the annual 180 billion government spend. The one thing they all agreed on out the campaign trail is getting rid of Māori language, getting rid of Māori elite, getting rid of whatever it is that tickles your fancy in terms of being anti-Māori. All three parties advance that notion, even NZ First Deputy Leader Shane Jones, saying, we have a lot in common with where ACT leader David Seymour is going on Māori sentiment and issues. Tamahiri told Radio Watia breakfast host Dale Husband, there are so many names in this, oh my goodness. <laughs> he says, despite 94% of New Zealanders voting for other parties, New Zealand First seems to be the tail wagging the dog. Tamahiri said the handbrake is already going on Māori spending across the whole of the public sector in anticipation of the new government. Tamahiri, also CEO of Fano Wai Parira and Final Order Commissioning Agency he said the problem is not just with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs dropping Te Reo Māori. He said non-Māori providers are still being funded, but Māori provider groups and partnerships are put on the back foot. We're waiting for money to come from the Ministry of Health to get us ready for our vaccination programs in the new year. We're worse off now than we were before the pandemic, and they know it. But right now they're holding up our funding. That's the racism we suffer under the subterfuge of, oh, there's a new government coming in, therefore we've got to put the handbrake on. He says the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy is in breach of laws such as the Paiora Healthy Futures Act. And to be honest, I can see where Te Pāti Māori is coming from in this situation due to the fact that all three of those parties said that they would cut Māori funding. They said they would remove a lot of te reo Māori in public spaces and public sectors, including department names. They have openly said that they would like to remove quite a bit of te reo Māori and Māori funding in all areas of our public sector, which is slightly, in my opinion, disturbing due to the fact that te reo Māori and Māori are a huge part of Aotearoa and New Zealand culture as well, but also due to the fact that Te Reo Māori is, a uh, is one of the three national languages of Aotearoa New Zealand, and it's getting stripped um, from everything now, which is slightly depressing, I guess, in my opinion. Tee -hee. <sighs> I... I don't know what to say. It's just... <sighs> it's a little bit... We make two steps forward, well, one step forward, two steps back, frequently. Um, with each government that we get, everything is going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and backwards and forwards. <sighs> Lovely. Lovely. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> Just, yeah, just processing, processing everything that's going on. Um, oof. Yeah, at the moment, politics is mostly just a lot of the, th a lot of what has been said is based around uh, negotiations with this new coalition. And obviously, important. 
but what happened here? Why we are not just having an act and national uh, coalition is due to the fact that with all the special votes coming in and secondary counted votes, we ended up with an overhang. So Te Pāti Māori gained another seat in uh, the Māori electorate. So we ended up with I think it's 121 members of parliament instead of 120. So ACT and NZ National no longer had the majority due to the fact that they uh, then had 60 to 60 and then they lost a seat so yeah very confusing I my brain is genuinely just <sighs> reading it is painful it is anyway <sighs> we're gonna move on where Aotearoa New Zealand political parties stand on the Gaza conflict as the death toll in Gaza continues to increase uh, I love it when stuff screws me over. And Israel's military operations across the territory go on. New Zealand's political parties remain split over the conflict. In the seven weeks since Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, the conflict has escalated and taken a huge humanitarian toll, leading to an increasing number of nations calling for immediate end to hostilities. New Zealand's two biggest parties have been tentative, but on Sunday, Labour leader Chris Hipkins threw his party's support behind an immediate ceasefire. Hipkins made sure to qualify it by saying that he was not making the statement as New Zealand's caretaker Prime Minister, but as his party's leader. On Monday, National Forest Foreign Policy spokesperson Jerry Brownlee told Radio NZ that Labour had been playing politics. So where does that leave New Zealand officially? At the moment, New Zealand's official position is not a call for ceasefire, but rather a humanitarian pause in the establishment of safe areas for civilians. An outline of the country's position on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade website asks all parties involved in the conflict to act in accordance with international law and to demonstrate basic humanity. Its position is that Israel has a right to defend itself, but must act according to international law and protect civilians. He has also con it has also condemned the attack by Hamas and called for the immediate Release, release of hostages. But not everyone in Parliament is completely aligned with the approach. National. Speaking on Monday about Hipkins' position, Brownlee told RNZ that while Labour had essentially called for the conditional ceasefire, that stance was still slightly different from his party's. National was not in favour of calling for an absolute ceasefire right now and had earlier sought advice provided by MFAT to the caretaker government. We like the first, which was that New Zealand moves to join with Australia and Canada in a statement that was essentially calling for ceasefire but making it clear there were conditions that had to be met. Those conditions include the release of the Israeli hostages and a five-day ceasefire to allow humanitarian aid to reach Gaza. Just calling for a ceasefire is not going to make it happen. We have to have a high degree of diplomacy and unfortunately all around and all around that Israel and Palestinian people are suffering. There has to be a whole process to go through and forgiveness on both sides to get to the point where there will be a ceasefire, but stating these conditions is reasonable position. Labour. With one foot out the door, Hipkins said Labour was urgently calling for ceasefire. He said while he recognised Israel's right to self-defence, he said that Israel Defence Force's actions were disproportionate and dis indiscriminate. He also called on Hamas to release all hostages without condition. Prior to that, he had straddled the line and avoided calls from coalition partners from within his own party to back a ceasefire. We remain very concerned about the humanitarian impact of the conflict and blockage uh, and blockade preventing essential services reaching people in Gaza. We are calling on Israel to allow movement of supplies in all parties to support the departure of those who choose to leave. The Greens, and this one has been controversial. The Greens have been unequivocal in their support for ceasefire in Palestine, with Chloe Shawbrick leading public demonstrations against Israel's military action. On Monday, she uh, took to the airwaves on News Hub's AM show to tell Labour it was about time they finally took a stance on the issue. It's incumbent on all political leaders in this country to stand up to the plate and to say they call for ceasefire, a return of hostages, and actually I would say for the incoming government to recognise the statehood of Palestine. The party's co-leader, Marama Davidson, was part of a peace flotilla intercepted by Israel's navy in 2016. Te Pāti Māori. Te Pāti Māori has been vocal in its condemnation of Israel's actions since, be it, since it became retaliating after the October 7th attack. 
The party has taken a strong line calling for the expulsion of both Israel's and the United States ambassadors. In a statement last month, the party said that not calling for immediate ceasefire was turning a blind eye to genocide. Aotearoa can no longer be complicit to the killing of innocent people, it continued. We, cannot, we can no longer provide political cover for US-funded imperialism. Act. Speaking on the AM show opposite Schwarberg, Act's leader David Seymour shared his view in that there was double standard in the conflict. If any other country was attacked the way that Israel has been attacked, I think the world would be saying, yes, this is terrible. But actually, the right thing to do is for the other guys to release hostages and stop attacking Israel. He said he advocated for a two-state solution and calls to expel the Israeli ambassador were completely wrong. NZ First. Despite being the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Winston Peters has not waded into public discourse surrounding the Gaza conflict. His only public discussion was two days after the initial Hamas... It's... <sighs> incursion into Israel, calling it abhorrent. He said he backed New Zealand's position of a two-state solution. Where are we at in the world? There is a growing clamour for peace among the global community, with the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres reissuing calls for peace after strikes kill women and children in schools in Gaza. This war is having a staggering and unacceptable number of civilian casualties, including women and children, every day. This must stop. Both the United States and the United Kingdom have deployed military assets to the Middle East, claiming they are a deterrent to possible ex escalation. Neither country's leader has called for a ceasefire, with US President Joe Biden writing in an op-ed in the Washington Post that ceasefire is not peace. Australia and Canada have taken similar positions. Australian PM Anthony Albanese has been undergoing pressure to come out in port support of a ceasefire, but has not done so. Neither has his Canadian counterpart Justin Trudeau, although he has been more publicly critical of Israel's actions, even drawing rebuke from Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. New Zealand is out of step with Five Eyes allies, the US, UK, Canada and Australia, who all designate both Hamas political and military wings as terrorist organisations. New Zealand distinguishes between the two, and the only military wing falls under the that designation Aotearoa National may change this. So, obviously, some heavy stuff. And not so great. Um, anyway, we are going to pop on uh, another few songs. And, yeah, political tea. And <laughs> we're going to listen to Can I Call You Tonight by Dayglow.
about a way to get you off my mind I used to be so tough Never really gave enough And then you caught my eye Giving me the feeling of a lightning strike Look at me now to you by the vamps honestly very popular song from when i was young younger i'm still young <laughs> i feel like i'm 80 some days but i promise i am not anyway so i'm feeling an opinion piece right now and i do love me a good opinion piece as many many people know <coughs> i like opinions so this is from Stuff, and it was posted on November the 15th. And it comes from Anchor uh, Subberwell, who is the owner of Immigration Advisory Visa Matters. He's a licensed immigration advisor dealing with complex immigration matters. And it's titled, Immigration Changes to Look Forward to or to Fear. Opinion. What might be some of the immigration changes being discussed at the Act, National Act NZ First Talks? All three potential coalition partners put out immigration policies before last month's election. It is anyone's guess how many of these policies will actually become law. Here are some of the ones that this particular person likes the look of. Long-term visitor visas for parents of NZ citizens and residents. This was included in both national and ACT manifestos. Both parties proposed a five-year multiple entry visitor visa for parents of NZ citizens and residents. National wants parents to have acceptable standard of health and to hold medical insurance before they are approved its parents boost visa, while ACT wants to charge a $3,500 annual fee to cover parents health care costs while they are in New Zealand. Whatever the final policy looks like, it will help to reunite Kiwis with their parents. Currently, overseas parents can only stay up to six months at a time on special category vis visitor visas or nine months on a general visitor visa. National plans to attract more international students. National plans to attract more international students by increasing the number of hours they can work each week from 20 to 24. The National Party also, explain, also plans to expand work rights for international students and their partners. This may mean relaxing post-study work visa requirements so that more students qualify for open work visas once they have completed a New Zealand qualification. 
This change is supported. One of the best ways to recruit international students is to offer work visas after completing studies. New Zealand benefits from tuition fees. They pay up to $50,000 a year for some postgraduate courses, as well as their later contribution to the labour market. Conflicting work visa policies. Potential coalition partners ACT and New Zealand First have conflicting work visa policies, neither of which is likely to come to fruition. ACT wants to abolish labour market checks, that is, the efforts that New Zealand employers are required to make to hire New Zealanders before they can hire workers from overseas. NZ First, on the other hand, wants to make it tougher to hire overseas workers. It wants to replace the accredited employer work visa category with a critical skill and labour shortage visa to ensure that Kiwi workers are at the front of the job queue. ACT is unlikely to support that policy, but National may have more success convincing its coalition partners to remove the median wage requirement for most accredited employer work visas, or at least freezing it at the current level. Most overseas workers need to be paid $29.66 an hour to be approved accredited employee work visa, employer work visas, and this threshold is supposed to increase to $31.61 an hour in February 24, and the increase won't be implemented. This person predicts at least. New visa categories. National's immigration policies include three new visas. The digital no-bad visa, a visa allowing people who work remotely for an overseas-based employer to stay in New Zealand for up to 12 months. Global Growth Tech Visa, a residence visa intended to attract people with ICT skills who have worked at a top global tech company earning at least $400,000 per year and International Graduates Visa, which allows graduates from one of the top 100 universities to be approved for three-year work visas. These new visas look great on paper, or electronically, if you prefer, but it remains to be seen how attractive they will be to their target audience overseas. In the first year of these new visa categories, numbers will be capped at 250 places, Digital Nomad and Global Tech, and 500 places for international grads. Two policies this person is not a fan of. They don't like the idea of NZ's first rural visa scheme, which obliges migrants to stay in communities of less than 100,000 residents for two years after they've been approved residents. Can you really force people to stay in the countryside? Maybe in China in the 60s, but not so easily in the 21st century in New Zealand. Both, nas both National and ACT want to increase visa application fees uh, the way that Uber increases its fares when everyone wants a taxi at the same time. ACT says we'll get rid of the complicated and burdensome system for temporary work visas and replace it with demand-based pricing to let employers decide if their need is worth the price instead of clunky bureaucracy. People who are willing to pay more for partnership residence application to be processed first will pay up to $8,668 more than three times current pricing based on Nationals' proposal. Sadly, I can't see New Zealand First ex objecting to this. Obviously, um, these are all just proposals and were put into the immigration plans for um, these parties. And Honestly, I think everyone knows that immigration is obviously going to be a big part of this particular government's um, priority. It's going to be at the top of their priority list as well. Um, it's quite a few other things, but I reckon that immigration is going to be very important, and particularly and employment laws are definitely going to be uh, very important to this government. We, will, we have yet to see, we have yet to see, but this has been in the works for a very long time. So... It is to be expected. Anyway, so a couple more songs and then I will close off for today, Fano. At the moment, there is really not much to talk about because a lot of the articles available are talking just primarily on coalition negotiations and it is a little bit difficult to find much else because obviously that is what's one, what, what, blah, 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 what is on everyone's minds. So this is uh, Better Together by Jack Johnson. There's no combination of words I could put on the back of a postcard No song that I could sing but I can try for your heart and Our dreams and they are made out of real things Like a shoebox of photographs with sepia tone loving Love is the answer at least for most of the questions of my heart Like why are we here and where do we go and how come we're so hard and It's not always easy and sometimes life can be deceiving I'll tell you one thing, it's always better when we're together mm, it's always better
better when we're together. Yeah, we'll look at them stars when we're together. Well, it's always better when we're together. Yeah, it's always better when we're together. I find the way into my dreams tonight, but I know that they'll be gone when the morning light sings or brings new things. For tomorrow night, you see that they'll be gone too. Too many things I have to do, but if all of these dreams might find their way into my day-to-day -day scene, I'd be under the impression I was somewhere in between, with only two, just me and you. Not so many things we got to do. What places we got to be? We'll sit beneath the mango tree now. Yeah, it's always better when we're together. Mmm, we're somewhere in between together. Well, it's always better when we're together. Yeah, it's always better when we're together.
that was Swinglin by Harmless. I love the, I love the rhythm. It's such a vibe. It's a beautiful day, Vano, and thank you for listening to me natter on about whatever it is I natter on about. <laughs> Much appreciated, and I will see you again next week on Political Tea. Kia ora. <laughs>